Tee up. It's time for the Blind Golf Canada podcast. Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to the Blind Golf Canada podcast. He's Darren Duma. I'm Jerry Nelson. We have Ryan with us from AMI, as well as producer Ryan behind the scenes making us sound good. Good like we do in each episode. That's horrible English, I know, but... It's been a while. We're pumped. We're excited to be back, and uh, we have a special guest with us today, but before we get to him, Darren, what's up with you, buddy? What's new in the blind golf world? Not much. We're just waiting for the snow to melt and uh, the sun to come out so we can get out there and start playing, so... It's... January is almost done. We've got February, and uh, some golfers will be starting as early as mid-March, with the U.S. Open in Columbus, Georgia, starting on March the 19th. And some of you, our guest included, along with you, Darren, and some others will be heading to Cape Town, South Africa, for the World Blind Golf Championships. And we're going to talk about that a little more into the podcast. But right now, on behalf of Darren, it is my pleasure to introduce to you one of our fine B2 golfers in Blind Golf Canada. He's also a para-athlete in other sports that we will talk about. And he is just recently the brand new author of a book called Deaf Blind Champion. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. Kevin Frost. Hey, guys. Hey, Darren. And hey, Jerry. Let's Pleasure to to hear and see you guys. You're too far away from Ottawa, but it's going to be an enjoyable program to share how to motivate and make people smile every day. Well, we're anxious and excited to talk about that too, Frosty. And uh, before we get into the book per se, for those of you that don't know Kevin Frost, uh Kevin, how old are you, first of all? I just, uh, I'm 55, just turned 55. And you 55, don't look a day over 50. Yeah, so I'm trying to hit 25, but I think I'm 55. Right. Kev, Kev, where were you born? I was born actually in Victoria, Victoria, BC. Really? I did not know that. And when and how did you end up in Ottawa? So, so in 72, Dad was in D&D Armed Forces, so we trained through, we drove across Canada to... Ottawa, and we've been in Blackburn Hamlet since 1972, and I've moved a couple of times now and living in the town of Orleans, which is kind of center of Ottawa. I'm I'm familiar with it. Uh, lots of guide dog training goes on there. 100%, yes. Kev, do you have any other family, brothers, sisters? Yes. Yeah, I have uh, my brother, Pat Frost. He's a staff sergeant in the, in the Ottawa police. He's... Uh, a wonderful gentleman. He does a lot of charity work for autism. He's been a big supporter for me on all my five different sports. And he also throws a big Kids Come First tournament for autism to help raise $50,000 for, for 10 families in Orleans. And they use Frosty as the putting, beat the blind guy in putting, and you get extra tickets. Okay, right on, right on. So, Kevin... You, uh, the condition that, that you have is called Usher syndrome, is that correct? Yes, it is. So I have Usher syndrome. So for the audience, Usher syndrome, is, I have type 2, where I lost my hearing young. And then when I was 30, I lost my vision. And the vision was part of the RP, but it's a double dual disability. So my hearing first, then my vision second. Helen, Helen Keller is type 1, so she was born deaf, born blind. Type three is your 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 vision first, and then your hearing. So I was the lucky soul in my family, which nobody else has encountered. But that's okay. I always say everything happens for a reason. Right, right. When you say you were young, uh, when you lost your hearing, how young? How? Li- excuse I was me. eleven. Eleven years old. I was actually approached by my math teacher, and he said, "Kevin, I realize when I'm behind you, you don't speak, but when I'm in front, you kind of." have better communication he said i think you have a hearing i said no i don't but i went and saw my uh, audiologist and he looked at me and he said oh my gosh kevin you only hear 25 percent at that time 
And so with the help of hearing aids and et cetera, et cetera, that helped me advance in the school system. But what was really more exciting was when I was uh, 10 years old, I had a speech impediment. So with the hearing aid, I had to learn how to speak without hearing words from the fresh. So it's a different way of, of, of living. With today's technology, I'm able to, to hear a little bit better with today's technology. But if I don't have my hearing aid on, I try to lip read to compensate for the word, miss words. So I have a conversation, a hundred words, I might hear about 60 and I fill in the blank. That's kind of how a uh, uh, hearing aids are great, but when you're out there on a windy course, it's like it's like you have no hearing, but that's reality. You know, if you complain yeah. about everything, you're not going to get anywhere. So I just, just learn to laugh and just deal with it. Kev, I, I was 11 years old when I lost my mother. Uh, oh. and, and the point of that Sorry being to that. is that uh, I know what people and especially kids can be like at age mm -hmm. 11. What yes. was it like for you uh, growing up from age 11 with a hearing impairment? It, it would, back in those days, it was tough because it was bulkier. I used to get teased and bullied. Oh, there's they're the deaf guy. Yeah, let's go make fun of him. But at the end of the day, I always kept my positive attitude going. Um, I always kept busy. Uh, at a young age, I had a paper route. I started refereeing hockey young. I had dreams to be an NHL linesman. So I just kept myself busy and and realized if, if the kids want to make fun of you, I just let it go. I always say every time you receive a negative, give back a positive. And that's kind of how I lived since I was a little kid. So And, t and I won't change that. Well, that is awesome, Kev. Now, you're 11 years old. You're growing up with this hearing impairment. 11 years later... Uh, I assume you're diagnosed at that time with RP, and uh, what was that like, not only to live with, but being diagnosed with that second or that double whammy, if yes. you like? Yes, yeah, so at 11, I was diagnosed with uh, the hearing, and then about 19 years later, I was diagnosed with, with the Usher syndrome. So during that transition, I became a workaholic because I wanted to... I had a goal to re to be a millionaire when I was 30. So I raised a family of three, Madison, Montana, and Mitchell. And at around age 25, my night vision got really bad. And I didn't think anything. I thought it was just old age. But what I used to, when I used to drive, I used to drive down that yellow line. And that's the only thing that got me home every night. What was more scary, guys, was when it was raining or snowing, I used to pull over and wait for an 18-wheeler so, because they used to have eight lights in the back of the truck, and that's how I got home. But that's the way I, I, I learned to adapt. A life is all about adapting. So, I continued to do that until I was 30. And I went and saw my audi, my uh, my ophthalmologist, and Dr. Peter Harding said, I got some news to share with you. And I said, doctor, I said, I'm doing really well. He said, well, you have a condition called Usher syndrome, Mr. Fast. And unfortunately, I have to do the hardest thing that a, a doctor had to do is I got to tell you I have to take your license away I got to take your job away you have to stop refereeing and you have to stop your land taking company so needless to say my workaholism just I, I even to this day I have good, like it, I can feel it now it's like hitting rock bottom it's like a black hole it was like I don't want to do anything who's going to pay my more kids who's going to pay my mortgage who's going to pay my kids education but Needs to say, hitting rock bottom, I've experienced it. I know what depression's all about. I know about what making a fair amount of money and now making very minimal. But at the end of the day, with the help of CNIB, I'm very blessed that they were able to give me my option to know, hey, Kev, you could go totally blind and totally deaf. We don't know. But we're going to help you get back on your feet. And with the help of CNIB, I get intravenous services. Intravenous services for the deaf blind mean I get nine hours a week to do banking, groceries, even go to, like I was telling Darren, uh, go uh, hit some indoor golfing because I can't read the screen. So my intervener K would say, hey, Frosty, you hit at 160, you were four degrees off. So that's kind of what intervenors are is all, kind of all about. So it created my so independent back. Kev, at, at what age? Was it at 22 or was it a little bit yeah. later? It that was 32, C 32, 32. 32, I'm sorry. 
No, no, no. So it's like 32 to... where it all started, and then 34 is kind of when the the ball kind of just went. You're done. You're not done, but you're into a new life. Right. So. And was it at age 34 that CNIB came on board yep. and intervened yep. services? That's that sort of yep. thing. Yeah, it created a new independent. It, it was it perfect? No, it wasn't. Wasn't overly perfect, but where it made it more perfect, guys, is when I got my service guide, first service guide dog, Nemo. That's what completed my life because having a service guide dog, it changed my life to independence. Why? A cane is great, but it doesn't tell you where the curbs are. It doesn't tell you where the, where the trees are. It doesn't tell you where to walk because I don't hear the trees. I don't hear the cars coming. So with the help of my first guide dog, Nemo, I was able to go think places faster and I was able to go everywhere. I fly in the plane. I I take him everywhere. I even when I had golfing with me. So and golfing, they would lie under my feet on the cart, and that's the way service guides because they want to be with you at all times. So you get your service dog, Kev, and from age eleven to now thirty four. Yeah. Uh, your service dog is wonderful. I've had them myself, uh, but that is a physical component to living every day, day to day. There right. must have been a lot of emotional upheaval, uh, a roller coaster up and down. Uh, I imagine 100%. it affected not only you, but your family as well. So very well said. So to put it in perspective, having blindness was, was is, is it is toughness as it is, having only now when you have 10% hearing, it throws a big loop on balance issues, communication issues. Do you know how frustrating it is when I gotta ask people to repeat what they said? It's not a it's not a pleasant world sometimes, but people are very acceptable to re, to repeat and sometimes two, three times. Cause that's my reality. But I've found I've f i have found ways to make it easier and, and adapt everything. So needed to say having the dual disability made it difficult growing up with my kids, communicating, even doing all the different sports. But I said to myself, I want to be a champion in everything I do. And that's the route. That's why I wrote a book called Death Plane Champion. I want to help people mentally. I want to I want to get them to a level that they've never been at. Wow. Those are some pretty, pretty strong words. So do you think the uh do you think the emotional upheaval and dealing with your condition has in in essence made you what you are today a hundred percent jerry and darren a hundred percent even going further i also did mission for 20 years to help 29 kids here in mexico and nicaragua that is what made me even stronger and i'll tell you why when you go to a third nation third nation country and they got no electricity no running water and they have really no houses to live like we live such a very comfortable life that taught me the importance of of life that made me stronger when i'm having a bad golf game or i fall down i go oh my god i could be back i could be back in mexico or nicaragua when they have nothing so everything we do in life is so important so being the mission for 29 and i'll share one experience had a, a boy named Alfredo who was seven years old. He'd never heard in his life. I drive into his village and about a hundred kids come out of nowhere. And Alfredo comes down the hill and Yvonne is my translator because it's Mexican. Said, here comes Alfredo. I forewarn you, he probably won't come near you. He doesn't know who you are. He doesn't know what to say. I said, don't worry about it. And so, he, uh, Alfredo comes down, sits on a swing, and I'm giving away food and clothes. And out of nowhere, I had a little more vision that time. I wave Alfredo. He came over. He grabbed my hand right away. And Yvonne looked at me and said, oh, my God. So needless to say, because he saw my hearing aid, he realized that he had a hearing loss. So we put two and two together by our vibes. So needless to say, he got really comfortable with me. Then I went back to his house, which is 10 feet by 10 feet with bamboo all over it, just cement walls that are 10 feet, sorry, 10 uh, inches thick by cement, and they sleep on the ground on a blanket. That's the way they live. So what I said to his mother, 
to translation of Yvonne said, I want to try something with Alfredo to see if he can hear. So being in the hearing world, I understand how a hearing aid works. So I was able to take my extra hearing aid and put it on Alfredo. Now you have to picture this, Alfredo for eight years has never heard a sound. So I put my hearing aid on it and he started to smile because he got to hear for the first time. So he took my hand, we went outside, he got to hear birds, he got to hear things he's never heard. What was more fascinating, guys, is he actually got to hear his mother's voice. And the first word that came out of Alfredo's uh, mouth was, Hi, Mama, in Mexican. That was a teary moment because it's, it's a gift in itself. So needed to say, he, he, uh, he, uh, he knew that I was a speed skater at that time and he was trying to imitate skating so it was a lot of fun to watch him do that but at the end of the day I promised his mother that I would get hearing aids for Alfredo so to do hearing aids I came back to Canada and I worked with the Lions clubs and I worked with the hearing aid companies we raised like three thousand dollars and I was able to get a, a hearing tech down in Mexico for Alfredo because we need the proper hearing aids then I went to the Mexican em embassy because you got to ship medical equipment to a diplomatic pouch. So it needs to say everything got set up, sent to him. Alfredo is living a normal life and he, he in school, he got speech therapy. He goes to the hospital to update his hearing aid. But what's fascinating, guys, is when I arrived at the village, they were all playing soccer with a two a two liter empty bottle, and it's just fascinating to watch. They're always happy. They're the poorest people in the world, but they were happy. It doesn't matter, and they were just happy to have a visitor there. So when I left with the hearing aids, it's with Alfredo. I asked him. I, every person that I help in the world, it can be an adult, it can be a child. I said, if there's anything I can get for you. What would it be? So the translation went through. What do you think Alfredo wanted as eight year old boy? What do you think he asked for? I asked him, doesn't matter how much it costs. Just take a guess. Take two guesses. What do you a think television. Darren? No, so they have no electricity. Take another guess, Darren. What do you think an eight year old boy would want? I would say a soccer ball, but he you, probably wants you know, his hearing. <laughs> there you go. So he got his hearing. You hit the nail on the head. He wanted the soccer ball because. They had a two-liter bottle. So I went to Walmart, bought him a soccer ball. The funny story is I came back a year later, and I went to see him. He come back, and the soccer ball is flat. So what I did is I went and bought three soccer balls and two pumps. So needs to say, I learned something about, could, because we got to realize we have electricity, we have water. So needs to say, all my stories were compelling that way. I I, I do TED Talks, TEDx Talks, and... And I talk about so many stories, and I could t I, I have over 50 stories that I could show you, but that's not the purpose of call. I just wanted to give you a genuine experience, what has made me stronger, doing the mission, helping people, and that is more rewarding, and that's why I'm a stronger person than I am. You know what, next time I see you and Darren and Jerry, I might not be at a, I might lose all my vision. I went and saw my hearing doctor, my ophthalmologist, he said, Kevin, your vision down, but keep your hopes up, keep doing what you're doing. Well, and what you've been doing, Kevin, has been absolutely amazing ever since I first met you and your fiance Loretta. I've gotten to know on you, gotten to know you rather, and me not being able to see you at all. And when we first met, uh, speaking to you just in a conversation, I had no idea of any disabilities of any sorts whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're out there playing golf with us. So, yes, of course, you've got to be visually impaired. I yes. had no idea about the hearing impairment, anything like that. And still to this day, I continue, continue to hear things about Kevin Frost and think, realize I had no idea. And I know a lot of other people out there in our world are have have made comments similar to to that as well and kevin given everybody that you have met and know within the parasport world the blind golf world can you tell us one thing that nobody knows yet about kevin frost i think in fairness 
my motto is every day is every day is a great day and always be happy and don't take life for granted because there are a lot more people who are worse off um, I know total blind and total deaf people and it's a different world altogether and it could be my world so needless to say there's many ways to answer that question is just remember to be good at what you want to do to be successful in your sporting world in life in relationships your finances I always say fail faster forward why because we know we all have to learn from our mistakes in every single sport that I have done and everything I have done in life I realize the only way we're gonna learn is is to move forward every time we can't change what's happened behind us but we can put a smile on people's face on um, being having that positive attitude I have some bad days of course I do but I have limitations and I realize the simplicity of life is is to truly to be happy every day because mentally I've been there and I know what it takes to get out of a black hole. I know what it takes to be a champion. I know what it takes to make people smile. And I know what it takes to, to move people. And that's why I do what I do. Wow. that's Those are great and very inspirational words, Kev. Um, amazing. And uh, speaking of good and successful, let's talk about some sports. Let's, <laughs> uh, let's start with blind golf. Okay. Um, how did you find out about blind golf? How did you get into it? Why did you get into it? And what attracted you to, to blind golf? Yeah, so there's a lot of factors. Beating five different sports in across Canada. And blind golf, uh, uh, about seven, I guess it would be my seventh year. I, I always just said I always enjoyed golf. And I didn't know if they had blind golfing. So I reached out, did some research, and... At that time, I didn't know what was out there. So long story short, I Googled and and with the help of some friends, I said, did you know that there is a, uh, an Ontario uh, organization called OVIG, Ontario Visual Impaired Golfers? I said, no. So I reached out to them and I said, oh, yes, we do blind golfing. And if you're interested, here's some membership package. And this is what we do to help blind golfers. And then I said, you know what? I like the fact that they're able to, to accommodate because I'm on long-term disability and, and they were able to offset that kind of one that kind of helped me make my decision because um, then I got okay now I'm in Ottawa like where do I start with a golf bag and where do I start so because I've done so many sports and because I, I ran into a lot of people uh, I had a gentleman named Glenn Costello and he said why don't you come to my golf course and I will get you started and I will train you for the first year. I will give you clubs and I will, you don't have to worry about, you just come here and golf will take care of you. So long story short, um, I really got interested with the help of Glenn and then, then, then it led to having a few guides that volunteered that they're marshals. And then it led to golf tech taking me on as a, just to help me out. So a lot of golfing people have come forward to help to make my journey financially viable. And I'm very grateful for Blind Golf Canada and I'm very grateful for now it's going to be Ontario Blind Golf. What they do because I couldn't afford to do what I do without their, their direction, without Glenn, without the guys who stepped up without the company to help me get to where we go. And now with the assistance of, of Blind Golf Canada going to Worlds, it makes makes, makes it very uh, very warming and very very humbling. So I need to say I'm very grateful. And, and, I, and I always say I'm still new in the sport. I got lots to learn. There's a lot of great B1, B2, B3. I still have lots to learn. So it's going to take a while to get up to the top. Well, the important thing, Kev, is that you are out here, and our motto is you can still play, and uh, you are obviously proving that. And as you were, you know, talking about who and how you got into it, 
it would be wonderful if every blind golfer had a Glen in their world, wouldn't it? Because have I've been doing have this a what, for sorry? Have a, what, a Glen, Glen. Okay. Forget his last name, Glen oh, Costello. Tom? Oh, Glen Costello. Yes, yeah. Glen Costello. Yeah, yeah. If everybody had a Glen Costello in their world. Yep. Um, I, I know the, the people that have helped me over the past 30 years, and uh, I don't think a lot of us would uh, would be doing what we're doing today without the help of, of so many other people. Darren, else, I think you had a, you had a question. Yeah. Yes, uh, I'm just going to ask, Kevin, uh, you're involved in the, the blind golf now, but what other sports have you uh, so, yeah, been involved in? Yeah, so it kind of all started out with uh, blind speed skating. So I did short track and long track. And short track is a 110-meter track, and we do distance of 500, 777,000, 1,503,000. 1, the average speed is about 40 to 44 kilometers an hour for myself on short track. I also do long track, which is a 400-meter tr track, and uh, the, it, my, the top speed on a 500 meter, I, I was clocked at 56 kilometers an hour by my coach, Mike Rive. Now, to put it in perspective, some people would say, well, how can a deafblind deaf person speed skate? First, I had to come overcome balance issues. So with the great help of great sport that I, organizations in, in Ottawa, I was able to come overcome balance. Because being deafblind, your balance is thrown off. So I had to in, learn how to to adjust and be adaptable on the ice. So long story short, uh, I ended up, uh, wasn't sure how they were gonna take deaf blind skater in short track. So it's like roller derby. So needless to say, I was able to compete against able bodied speed skater because my goal was to get as many blind people or try and get blind speed skating to grow. So the only way I could do that is to compete with able body. So I did short track. And I did very successfully. Then I switched over to long track. This is where I gained momentum. So I went to compete at six World Cups at the Able Body World Champions. And when I went to all these events, I went to the different countries to educate what I was doing to try to get more blind skaters from their country to participate. So I need to say, in, I went from 24th to 18th to 12th to 11th. And about four years ago, I finished eighth in the world against Able Body. That was a huge accomplishment for myself against the able body. And I'm very blessed for the even the skaters allowing me to compete with them. But they all had good sportsmen. I became an idol for them because they realized the severity of, of, of my disability. And to, just to show how in speed skating, Netherlands is, is the speed skating capital of the world. When I went to their world championship... Before I even entered the country, they knew who I was, what my time was. They knew what I eat. They know everything about you. So that's how well mm -hmm. Netherlands is a speed skating camp. So needless to say, it was just a huge accomplishment. I met a lot of uh, very prominent speed skaters from Netherlands, and they all just came. They said, amazing. So I was able to get Jeremy Weatherstone, and Cindy Class and and Richard Schubert's Ivan E. Blondin, Isabel, why did to skate in my shoes? So I got glasses and earmuffs put on them, and it was fun to watch them because they were just very disoriented. So Cindy Claston came back and said, she just laughed and said, I'm afraid to go around the corner with the vision you have. And Richard Schubert, he was a little, little more daring, but he had to hold on to me because he didn't realize how close he was to me. Ivany Blondine and Isabel were just very supportive. They were younger. Now they're on the they're the champions of, of, of speed skating Canada right now as we speak. So it was just fun to experience that. But I don't do that to to say to feel sorry. I just do that to show what the severity I deal with. So how do I speed skate? So when you start, I don't hear the 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 guy say ready. They lower an orange band, an orange orange band that goes down to the ground. That means ready. So when I, when you finish your race, there, there's a lap counter. I can't read the numbers. There's a, a bell lap. I can't hear it. So through my FM system, my hearing aid, my coach would communicate with me to let me know when I'm getting close to the corner, to attack to the corner. So that kind of educates how I'm able to speed skate. Trust me, I've been DQ'd a lot. I fell a lot. I've been injured. I was out for six months commission. So I need to say, speed skating was my alpha because... I got a chance to go to the World Championship in Russia and Scotland, and I was able to, to become a three-time world champion. And going to those events, 
they they really changed the dynamics of of what it takes to be a champion at that level in short track and long track in Scotland and Russia and Canada. So it's a very fascinating experience to compete with other skaters around the world with with just the vision issues. So that would have been my humble so, experience. Kev, it, which is which is harder? Speed skating or blind golf, or can you even compare the two? You know what? They all have. They all have their different. Every sport has the same principles, and I'll tell you why. Speed skating. I did rowing for Canada. I did track for Canada. I did tandem cycling. Every sport has the same fundamental. They all have obstacles, but it all comes down to this, Jerry. The harder we try, the harder I sped it, the harder I ran, the harder I did on tandem, the harder I did I do golfing, the more mistakes you have. You got to find that comfort zone and just be relaxed. And that's when you play the best game. That's when I skated the best. That's when I did tandem, right? When I do a 100K race under three hours, that's when I perform the best. When you try harder, it sounds weird, you, you fall apart. So you got to find that comfort zone. And so here's a funny story. And I was at my World Cup in Russia. My coach comes to me and says, today we're going to do something different. My very first race, 500 meters, he said, we're going to try something different. I only want you to skate 80% at this rate. And I looked at him. I said, you crazy, Mike? So I followed his message. I went off to did the race. And I said, are you happy? But I, fe I felt I didn't do my best race. He said, you know what? I'm ecstatic, Kevin. That's your world record. And you skated smarter. So the simple message to all athletes Find your comfort zone, be relaxed, you're going to play well in every sport you do. And that's what I figured out. That's how I figured out in all five sports. That's good advice. That's excellent advice. Let's talk about your book, Kevin. Uh, Deaf Blind Champion, it's called. Uh, why did you write a book? Yes, yeah, so I have it in front of me, Jerry. I got the book, a little of my book called De I'm just showing it. And it's a picture of me and Lewis going down a fairway. And, and on the on the title it said Deaf Blind Champion The Journey of of uh, it's the the true story of hope and inspiration of excellence in sports and life. Why did I choose it? I think because doing five different sports and overcoming mental challenges and overcoming sharing the stories with my service guide dog have Nemo and Lewis and sharing the stories of advocacy. I, do, I also do advocacy to help provincial and federal to get more funding for people who need it. So needless to say, in this book, I share about everything, but I also share the people who helped me on the way. So I want to motivate. I want to help people who, who are not, if they don't know what to do in life, or they're just having a bad day. Read this book. You're gonna, I guarantee you're going to change your life, and that's why I uh, decided to do it. So, in a couple of sentences, Kev, if I was to ask you the message, the direct message to people stemming from your book is, is, question mark. Okay, just is repeat. what? Just repeat the question. What, what, is, what is your message, Kev? My message, my message is, for me, become a deafblind champion with, with only three senses left. I was able to do this all my life. It didn't matter if it was sports. It didn't matter if it was just uh, doing a job. It didn't matter if I was in a relationship, raising your family, growing older. The main principle here is I want to teach people the importance of life. And, and, and to be a champion in everything we do in life, there are very important fundamentals. There's your health. There's your positive attitude, there's adaptability, there's your giving, and you also have to have dreams. So if you put them all together, that's how you can become a champion of what you want to do. So that's why I produced this book, to help people. And and at the end of the day, parts of the proceeds from the book are, is going to go back to uh, Canadian Guide Dog, because I had Nemo for 10 years, and Lewis, and unfortunately Lewis actually a month sorry, a week ago passed away but i lost him in september because he had three degrees uh kidney disease so but in a very important part of my life but that is also in the book my guide dog stories some funny stories some i always nickname my 
Nemo as puddles because he would walk around the puddles and I would go through them. So I called them puddles. Hmm. So, so I need to say, but what back to golfing, which is very exciting, exciting is I've met so many wonderful people and, and you guys are, are, are an also inspiration, Jerry and Darren. Darren's such a goal getter. He's helped the sport so much. And we, we need, without Darren, some of the events would be very hard to run properly. So we have great people in the organization who go out of their way to do more. So they need to be recognized for that too. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. So, Kevin, when not everybody can start out in life and get to the point where they are a successful champion in multiple sports and have the experience and the, um, I guess, inspiration, if you will, to, to write a book. Why do you think people get stuck from time to time along the way when dealing with and living with disabilities, in our case, hearing loss and, and, and vision loss? Why do you think people struggle from time to time? You know why? I think we all live in a box and the reason I say that when I ask you that what does that mean we all live in a box just curious what Darren and Jerry are thinking and I'll, and I'll tell you why first thing that comes to my mind is confinement okay and Darren when I say we all live in a box and why uh, sometimes we get uh, isolated with our with our situation and we kind of just uh stay within that box um yes so to answer that question is when we, when disabled or not if we live in a box we're gonna have we're not gonna ever gonna be able to push through the barrier and this is where i'm going to share with you guys do you realize we live in a box we look at a box every day as our phone we work on a computer which is the box do you realize that we live in a box do you realize that when you go to work, you drive in a box or you take the box to get to work and we also work in a box? Do you realize when we fly to a country, you're flying a plane, you are in a box to get to the airport, which is the box. And then you go to the hotel with that. So my point here is everything goes great until there's a problem. And when there's a problem, we still only think inside the box. So the problem, if you're, if you're, upset or you're or you're having a, a, a bad day or you can't get out of the rut if you stay if you if you stay in that box and you overanalyze and you and and you and you keep on doing it and being repetitive you're never going to get out of that rut so the problem is we need to start thinking outside the box and why because you need a different perspective to solve that problem i use this principle with my tedx talk with companies and I've, I've, I've done, an, uh, I do the presentation for universities, for the high schools, and, 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 and I'll tell you why. A month ago, I did a presentation for 16 teenagers between 14 and 18, and they all had an anxiety disorder. So the teacher, teacher, teacher says to me, just understand that these kids won't talk to you because they're so anxious. And, and I said, you know what, don't worry about it. So I go do my presentation and I started talking about what, what is the hardest things I got to deal with and what are their dreams. And then I said, just so you know, my daughter has Asperger's syndrome. If you know what Asperger's syndrome is, it's a disorder, a disorder that takes, it's, it's, your, it's an anxiety disorder. So mm -hmm. needless to say, all these 16 kids started opening it up. So we started talking and the teacher looks at me and she says, I can't believe it. I've been doing this for five years. I've never seen this kind of interaction. So my message to the audience, the message to you guys is, I was able to get into all those girls who have an anxiety disorder because they are only focused inside the box. I also educating how to think outside the box. Needless to say, all those 16 girls, I've gotten emails and, and emails from the teachers. They've changed their life because I taught them how to think outside the box. We are, we're, not learned, we're not taught that in school. We're not taught that in business. We're not taught that in, 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 in sports, in psychology, but it needs to come out. So that's my message to the people who are struggling, who want to get out of the rush. We have to start thinking outside the box. Well, and again, Kevin, very inspirational and the fact that 
you can help and be a catalyst uh, for and to those people who need a little help to get outside of the box and begin to start to, to think out there. So uh, I get what you're saying totally and um, very inspirational. I, I can see why you're in demand for a speaking presentation and advocacy presentations uh, all over. Um, let's move on and talk a little more golf there. And you had a question. Well, yes. Uh, speaking of being inspirational and all that, what's your best score in golf, uh, Actually, Kev? So my best score would, uh, on my own with my regular crew is 84 and on tournament would be 87. So I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to hover under ninety this year, but again, you know how golf is. Sometimes when you when you when you when you think you got it, and then you kind of you kind of go back two steps. So, needless to say, uh, if I could get into the eighties, it would be very respectful for me to be on on par. But if I hover around ninety, I have to deal with that and f tweak some things. The old saying in golf: two putt wins your tournaments. <laughs> and. Uh... Do you, have you had a hole in one yet? No, I'm six inches away from a hole in one. So I'd, I'd You're love close. To, yeah, so. I would love to experience that. But you know what? When it happened, but it not it's just being out there and and enjoying the game and 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 of course golf can get frustrating. Trust me, I get frustrated sometimes too because I just shake my head. If I would have just golf this way when I was at my home course, I'd be shooting that. But that's not reality. It's a world of frustrated golfers oh, out there. Guys, yeah. isn't isn't it interesting, you know, the difference between six inches and six feet. You know, you, you hit it to six feet on a par three or an approach shot, and you think that's a great shot. And you hit it to six inches, you don't think how great a shot it is. You're thinking right away that I'll be back tomorrow. I'm coming back because if I can get that close... I can put that goddamn ball right in that hole, and it really keeps a guy coming back. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I had my last few games. I have Nigel, who's my my my, my other blind caddy, and uh, I never get to experience it. But I had a an a, I had a seventy, an eighty, and a ninety shot that went right in. Never never got to hear it or see it, but I got to watch your reactions. Wow, that's fantastic, Kev. You've been—you said you've been playing blind golf what seven years now? I'll be on my seventh year, so six years. On, on your seventh year, over the past six years, how has your game held up over those six years, and how has it progressed and changed through those I, six years? I find at the beginning, uh, just getting the feel of of uh, of um, learning the the distance, learning your club, and then. Finding, finding a guide that you can trust, and now I have Loretta, who is my guide most of the time. But I also have personal guides at home. But also learning the different kind of uh, clubs that I can use to help a golf tech, and uh, I think just trying to tweak some things to make my game a little bit better on the fairway, and and trying to try new techniques on the putting to help try and get those two putts, it's probably where I'm going to get my biggest gain because I can never see the slope. So th that's the reality of my sport. So I just have to learn to trust my guide and hopefully Loretta or Nigel or Glenn or, or Fred can read the green better for me. And that's all I really can do at this time to improve my game. I know there's a lot more things that I could do to get the ball further, but what I'm realizing is the harder I try, the more it goes where I don't want it to go. So need to say, I think sometimes when you have a par, a par five, if I can get there in three, that I'm, I'm happy with that. But that happened maybe 50% of the time. If I could get that up to 75, I, I think it'd be a better, that'll improve my longer game. Yeah, so what would you say your your strongest part of your game is? Uh, I think my, sounds like the putting. The putting, and actually, my my my, I'm gonna say my hundred game in is my strongest. I'm gonna say is my strongest game, and I'm hoping that I can get my driving a little more, uh, like w within five degrees to the right or left this year. And if I can improve that, 
uh, I think it'll uh, it'll it, it'll help get my into the eighties. Kev, when you look at a typical golf season, how and where do you typically play and practice? And by that I mean. You know, do you go to the range so many times a week? Do you play so many holes in a week? Um, what what are your what are your practice and playing habits? Very fortunate because two kilometers. I have a I have a golf a golf. It's an it's only a a three par nine hole, but they have a beautiful uh, practice uh, sand shot putting and driving range, so I can go there pretty well unlimited. But I I, I practically do two to three. Two for sure, but sometimes three games a week. I, I have a Monday group, and then I have a Wednesday group, and then if I can get an extra one, but at the end of the day, it's, I have to go when the guide available because I could go yeah. hit the ball, and I'll be looking for the ball forever. So it's really funny. I'm up on the green, and, and Loretta said, the ball's right there, and I'm trying to look at my tunnel vision. I don't see it. So sometimes she's got to come and just kind of point right at it like or, or put her foot right <laughs> inside the ball. It's just and, or sometimes when you're driving up, Sometimes when you're driving up with the, with with the ball, um, the uh, we, I see the ball when I go up and I go get my club and I go back. I go, where's the ball? It's in the same spot, but I can't see it. Yeah, just something like yeah. that. Do you enjoy practicing? I do. Guys, uh, I know we uh, we got to wrap up soon here. You're both going to the. Uh, the World Championships in Cape Town, South Africa, in uh, in March. Um, Kevin, have you ever been to a World Championships before? Not not in the blind golf. No, this would be a first, and I'll be definitely be open minded and 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 just go there to enjoy and try to be try to be simple. It's going to be a trip of a lifetime, no doubt. I am sure. Um, Guys, we're going to wrap up quickly here. And Kevin, how we usually wrap up is with some just simple, fun, rapid fire questions. Uh, I'll ask you and you just blurt out the first answer that you think of, okay? okay. Favorite club in your bag? Putter. What brand of clubs do you play? Cobra, Puma. Favorite course you've ever played? Uh, probably Eagle Creek in Ottawa. Favorite country you've been to to play blind golf in? At this point, it'd probably be, probably be USA. Favorite pro golfer? Tiger Woods. Sens or Leafs? Sens all the way. Okay, good man. Favorite restaurant meal? Uh, I'm going to go with a place I go to, Tyro's. They're very good to me. They never charge me, so I just go there all the time. Awesome. Kev, you've been great. Thank you so much for coming on. Tell us quickly, how can people get your book? Yeah, so if people want to reach out, it's on Amazon. So you just Google DeafBlind Champion. It'll come up. Uh, you can get the paperback and ebook, and I'm on the process of trying to get the audio book. It's taking a little bit longer. So, again, you can go to Amazon, just Google Deafblind Champion, or you can go to my website, which is www.deafblindspeechgator.com, www.deafblindspeechgator.com. You get to know a little more about me. It gives them more briefing, but, again, Amazon is the best approach. Kev, thanks so much for coming on. There's a lot of stuff that we didn't get to today. We That's hope okay. you'd consider coming back at some point. There's a lot. There's and a lot of ground. We, there's a lot of things I can talk about. We we would love to have you back. So on uh, on that note, Darren, why don't you uh, mention and thank our sponsors before we get on out of here? Oh, thank you, Jerry. I would like to thank AMI and of course Mark and Ryan that are on today, and also CNIB Foundation, Canadian Council of the Blind and our Lions Clubs across Canada, and last but not least, ISPS Handa. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And remember, at Blind Golf Canada, you can still play. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. Everybody, every day is a good day. This has been the Blind Golf Canada podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for tuning in.